We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 this morning. I was particularly drawn to verse 17, where he says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Uh, you know, we're in a situation where uh, we're not able to always be together like, like we'd like to. Uh, the world talks about uh, social distancing. Well, Paul was experiencing social distancing to a, to a great degree. Uh, those words taken from you, are the, the, the meaning is the word orphaned. He, he was completely separated from them. But it didn't change his heart. Uh, he wasn't taken from them in heart. And he was still endeavoring to, to serve the Lord. And it made me think, how are we going to react? Uh, what's going to be our response when other Christians are taken from us? Uh, are we going to respond by uh, going down in our, in our Christian uh, endeavor? Or is it going to encourage us to rise to the occasion and grow? And I want to encourage you this, this morning. Uh, take to heart God's word. Uh, there'll be times when, when we're separated from others. Uh, but God is, is with us. Uh, God has given us the promise he'll never leave us or forsake us. Let me read uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, starting verses 12 and 13. That ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now for us to have a walk that's worthy of God, uh, one of the things that has to happen is we have to walk according to God's word. Uh, these were people, the, the church at Thessalonica, that had been saved out of idol worship, and it changed their lives. And, and the reason it changed their life was because they believed what God said. They didn't take it as the word of man. They took it as the, as the word of God. They received God's word. He, he uses the phrase there, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And that's the key. We have to believe it. Uh, I, I know plenty of people who read the Bible, but they don't believe it. In fact, there's some who read it in, in order to um, oppose it. But as Christians, uh, we believe this is God's word. Faith is the key. In fact, God says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith. There's so many things as you go through the Bible that he says God's word will do for you. Uh, I, I jotted down just a, a few things here, and, and there's many more. Uh, for instance, the, the Bible is what saves you. The Bible says in 1 Peter, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are you saved through faith. When we believe God's word, we can be saved. Well, God's word also guides us. Psalm 119, 105, many of you would know this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word revives us. The psalmist wrote in Psalm uh, 119, quicken me according to thy word. Revives us. Uh, in Psalm 1911, moreover by them is thy servant warned. God's word warns us. And the, the them he's talking about there is God's law, God's testimony, God's statutes, God's commandments. God's word, it warns us. And in keeping of them, there's great reward. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, God's word judges us. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word helps us to know the truth. He judges us. We can deceive ourselves, but God's word received by faith will help us to know God's way. Uh, John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God's word will sanctify us. It'll make us more like Jesus, help us to live holy lives. John 15, 3, now ye are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. God's word cleanses us. In Ephesians, he talks about the cleansing of the word. And what a blessing it is that God's word received by faith effectually works. 
On and on it goes. John 8, 31, it, he frees us. The truth shall make you free. At Colossians 3, it, it, it enriches us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, 1 John 4, uh, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. It gives us joy. Uh, God's word received by faith changes us. The question I would ask you this morning is, how do you treat God's word? You know, you see uh, pictures in the news sometimes of people walking along looking at their phone and they'll, they'll fall off an edge or they'll fall into a fountain or run into somebody uh, you know, if we would treat our Bible as important as our phone, maybe it would change our life. Now, I wouldn't recommend you read your Bible and fall off a cliff or walk into a fountain, uh, but we, we should treat our Bible as important as our phone. Carry it with us. Always looking at it. Have you noticed crowds lately? 75% of them are sitting there looking at something, <laughs> and it's usually a phone. If we would have our Bibles uh, that important in our lives, what a difference it would make. Well, in, in the Bible, uh, Job asked the question, uh, or he see, makes the statement, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Is God's word more important to you than food? It should be. In Psalm 119, 114, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimony as much as in all riches. Is God's word at least as important to you as money? <laughs> Uh, many times, money take, gets the edge over God's Word and what God is saying, and it shouldn't be. Uh, one of the main truths that we have to understand for us to have a walk that's worthy of God is that we need to appreciate God's Word. You know, just that phrase, God's Word. It's God's Word. It's the Word of God. Uh, a person who appreciates God's Word will hear it. Their, their ears will prick up. Uh, and they'll not only hear it, they'll appropriate it. That means to receive it. Uh, when I was growing up, sometimes people would use that word appropriate to mean they were going to steal something. <laughs> I'm going to appropriate that. Well, we can't steal God's word, but we can make it our own. And we need to appropriate God's word, appreciate it, appropriate it. And thirdly, we need to apply it. We need to live God's word. That's what happened to these people in Thessalonica. They received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The walk worthy of God will be a walk according to God's word. But secondly, the walk worthy of God will also be a walk contrary to the world. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. If you're going to live like a Christian, you will be living differently than the world. Uh, there in, uh, in verse, what was it, verse 14, he became followers of the churches of God. It, that meant they were living like Christians. They were living the way Christians live. And because of that, they suffered uh, persecution. It, the walk that's worthy of God is going to be different than the world's walk. So the Christians received the word. Uh, they followed the Lord Jesus. They imitated him. They persevered in spite of suffering. But the world, if you notice there in verse 15, they didn't received the word, they killed the word, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Uh, they didn't help the saints, they hindered the saints. Uh, they persecuted them, he says in, in, in verse 15. Uh, they forbid people to, uh, to, not, to be able to come. John 3.36 shows this stark contrast uh, in, in results. You know, we often often read John 3.16. John chapter 3 and, and verse 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. What a contrast. If you're going to follow Christ, I like that contrast. I don't want to be part of the wrath of God. I want to be part of the life of God. 
In uh, 1 John chapter 2, he gives this contrast as well when he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away on the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There's the contrast. When you, when you follow the Lord, uh, there's going to be a difference. Um, are you going to walk according to Jesus, or are you going to walk according to the world? There's a big pressure to, to fit in, to conform ourselves uh, to the world's patterns. The Bible tells us we need to be conformed to the image of Christ, and that will make you different. Uh, these people in, in Thessalonica, they had a walk that was worthy. First of all, because they valued God's word. They walked according to God's word. Secondly, because they were willing to be different than the world. They knew what they'd come from. Uh, they didn't want to worship idols anymore. They knew that idols are no gods, no gods at all. And they wanted to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But thirdly, the worthy walk is in spite of hindrances. In spite of hindrances. Look at verse 17 there in, in 1 Thessalonians 2. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. You know, Paul wanted to be with them. He wanted to minister to them. But he couldn't. Hindrances had come. And you know, in your life, there are going to be hindrances. And ultimately, they, they come from Satan. Now, I don't believe Satan has the time or, or the power to, to afflict every, every one of us personally. Uh, he's got plenty of emissaries. Uh, but the Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. And, and there's the, the spirit of the world and so on. But hindrances will come. And we need to serve the Lord in spite of hindrances. Sometimes we hinder ourselves. Sometimes we're just careless. Now, the word hinder means to impede one's course by cutting off the way. Uh, have you ever heard the expression, you cut off his nose to spite his face? Uh, you know, sometimes we'll just do things that, that just hinder us in how we uh, approach our life. Our own sin hinders us. In Galatians chapter 5 and uh, verse 7, he's talking to the, the church at Galatia and he says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? See, they'd, they'd hindered themselves by, instead of looking to Jesus, looking to the law and to other things. And he, he says then later, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little sin can cause a great hindrance. Sometimes our attitude is the problem. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, he says to, to that church, do all things without murmurings and disputings. <laughs> Sometimes we just have a, a bad attitude, and it hinders us. Later on, he says, we're, we're to shine as lights in the world. Uh, we're not to be like the world. We're to be like Christ, a, a light. And he says that uh, the, the reason for that is so that we can hold forth the word of life and rejoice in, in the day of Christ. We're, there's going to be hindrances. Some of them will come from ourselves. Sometimes we can be our worst enemy. But you know, God can help us with that. Sometimes we just give up. We get tired of the battle. Well, God says, don't faint. Uh, faint not, he says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and, uh, and verse 7. He tells us we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Uh, we're just humans. And he says the reason God uses us as humans, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. See, the glory is not for us, it's for the Lord. And as we try to walk that worthy walk, as we try to follow the Lord, there's going to be hindrances, especially because we're just clay. We're just earthen vessels. And yet God can use us and bless us. He, he talks about we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. He talks about the fact that um, we are doing this to the glory of God. 
And then in that same chapter, 2 Corinthians 4, he says, For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. God's Holy Spirit helping us, uh, getting us past those hindrances, strengthening us, uh, promising us uh, His power and His presence. Sometimes others hinder us. I, I think usually our greatest enemy is ourself. But there are, like in Paul's situation, uh, people who just glory in trying to tear down the cross, trying to tear down the work of God, uh, hindering uh, Christians. And that's what he's talking about there in, in, second, in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verses 14 to 16. Uh, how that they, they suffered uh, from their own countrymen, uh, people who persecuted them and, and were contrary to all men, forbidding them to, to speak to the Gentiles and so on. Uh, there'll be people who'll hinder you. Uh, there'll be people who, who, who try to stop you serving the Lord. Uh, sometimes those very people will do that because God is convicting them of their sin. If you've ever been at a function where everyone is drinking, and you don't drink. Oh, man, they try to get you to drink because it makes them feel guilty to have you doing the right thing when they're all doing the wrong thing. Well, uh, there are those who just want to stop you doing the right thing because they feel so guilty knowing they're doing the wrong thing. But God can use your life as a testimony. You know, the very Apostle Paul, before he was saved, man, he went around persecuting Christians. But every time he saw the testimony of a Christian, and the Lord spoke to him, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and he trusted Christ as his Savior and became persecuted rather than the persecutor. Uh, there are those who hinder us. But he talks here in verse 18, Satan hindered, hindered us. Sometimes Satan hinders us. A and we have to understand, Satan is behind all the wickedness in this world. Now, he tempts us any way he can. He'll use any method, any person, any situation he can uh, he resists anything good. He resists any godly activity. He hindered Paul. Paul was not able to minister to them the way he wanted to do. But I want you to notice something. Paul didn't let it cause him to sin. He didn't sit down and say, oh, woe is me. I can't do what I want to do. No, he said, I I'm separated from you physically in presence, but not in heart. And we'll see in the next chapter some of the things he did to, to be able to, to minister to them, even though he couldn't be there. There's many songs we sing on, in this regard. Uh, there's one, the things of earth will dim and lose their value when we recall they're borrowed for a while. You know, the things of earth, they're not permanent. Corinthians, he, he says, the things that are seen are temporal. All these things that we work for and all these things we get so upset about, uh, they're just temporal. You know, Satan may hinder us, but we have this promise from God's Word. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Our God is greater. And you know, sometimes God even takes Satan's hindrances and gives you a ministry in that area. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Bible talks about how our God is the, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. It's, it's 2 Corinthians 1, verse 4, who comforted us all in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Yeah, we, go, we get hindered, we get troubled, and God ministers to us, and God helps us. And then when someone else has that trouble, we're able to help them. We're able to be a comfort. And the next verse 2 Corinthians 1, 5, uh, I think is a, is a promise. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. What God is saying there is, whatever Satan can throw at you, God has a solution that's greater. God will give you more. Uh, in Romans, the Bible says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Listen, sin is great. Sin is destroying our world, destroying our families, destroying our country. But God's grace is greater. Uh, when hindrances come, oh, they can be terrible, but God's grace is greater. You need to hold on to that promise. You need to understand that promise. You see, that's part of God's word effectually working in them that believe. 
We not only hear it, we believe it, and we act on it. Uh, when sin comes, God's grace is greater. Uh, you will have hindrances in your life. Trust the Lord. A walk that's worthy of God is in spite of hindrances. God doesn't say he's going to take away all your troubles, but he says he'll go through, go through them with you. He'll help you. A walk that's worthy of God is contrary to the world. Don't be afraid to be different when it means being like Jesus. And a walk that's worthy of God is according to God's word. I would ask you this morning, what is your hope? Well, Paul ends there in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. That chapter ends, I should say. Verse 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? What is, what is your hope? What's your joy? What's your crown of rejoicing? He says, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Now, I, I think what he's saying there is uh, my hope, my joy, my crown of rejoicing is that someday we're going to have eternity with God. We're separated now physically, but someday we're going to be together for eternity. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, we sing the song, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Well, that's true. And we need to look forward to what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, and promised us a place in heaven. Even if Paul never saw them again on this earth, he would see them in heaven. They would be in heaven together. Uh, he's saying God's glory is before us. There's many difficulties. I, I doubt if any of us will suffer the difficulties Paul did. I, I hope not. And, and yet, even with those difficulties, he understood the, the glory that was to come. Uh, we may be separated now, but someday we'll be in heaven together. Now, there's only one thing that we can take to heaven with us. That's people. And what a, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we see the, the one who led us to Christ. When we see uh, the ones that, that we turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and led to Christ. Uh, these were people who received God's word and were changed. Uh, let me ask you this morning, are you sure of heaven? Are, are you one of, of these people that he's talking about who's received God's word, uh, who, who is uh, going to be in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Do you know for sure that you've trusted Christ as your Savior? Are you trusting Jesus? Now, Romans 10, verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God promises. He says that he, he that comes to him, he'll in no wise cast out. Uh, there's no one who can't come to the cross and be saved. I was at uh, the chemist. I think it was yesterday, and uh, you know, with this social distancing, they, they had a sign. It said, for social distancing, stand on the cross. <laughs> they had these crosses on the floor. And I thought, man, that'll preach. <laughs> and it made me think, you know, for spiritual closeness, stand on the cross. If, if you want God's help and God's blessing, go to the cross of Jesus Christ. Stand on the cross. That's, that's where the blessing is. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ who lived for us and loved us and died for us and rose again and offers us eternal life. Are you sure of heaven? And secondly, will you be bringing anyone with you? Uh, we need to be sure that uh, in these times of separation that we're not being separated, we're not separating ourselves from the Lord. You'll get opportunities to share Christ with people. Listen, people are thinking about life and death. And you need to uh, be willing and ready to, to share God's word with them. You know, I, I saw some people I hadn't seen for a while this week, and uh, I said, well, I can't invite you to church. And it made me think, you know, we need to be careful. We're not just inviting people to church. We need to invite people to Christ. And that's what I'm, I'm saying to you this morning. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, it's not enough to come to church. You need to come to Christ. Come to Him with your sin. He's the Savior. He'll forgive your sins and cleanse you. You're the sinner. He's the Savior. And He promises that uh, if you'll come, He'll forgive you. Uh, this morning, uh, God help us in these times to live with eternity in our hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we are so grateful for your loving kindness. Uh, Lord, thank you for the example of these who've gone before us and uh, walking and, and following you and, and living for you in spite of 
uh, the, the persecution and troubles. Lord, help us in, in our times of trouble to trust you. I pray, Father, if there are those this morning that are not saved, that, that they would uh, trust you today, that they would be born again. Lord, help us as Christians to be growing. Help us to be trusting you and, and learning of you and uh, being more like your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the opportunities that we have. Thank you for your grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.